Okay, I think we are live. Hello, everyone. Uh, trailblazing families, welcome. I have, um, I think, the initial trailblazing parent <laughs> with us today. We've got Andreas Will Gerdes here. Am I pronouncing it correctly, Andreas? Anything works. Okay, great. So we have Andreas, and yeah, I think he was the initial trailblazing parent, and uh, he's uh, been a digital nomad for a long time. I've heard him being called the original <laughs> digital nomad, the first one. No, but Andreas launched a uh, co-founded a mobile company, and uh, he's been an entrepreneur for many years, and uh, supporting and mentoring other entrepreneurs. He's done lots of really interesting projects, and he has been a big fan and a big advocate for the remote work and digital nomad, location independent, whatever you want to call it, movement, including with kids, it is possible. We were just talking about that, that some digital nomads don't think it's possible to continue this lifestyle with kids, but it is possible. So I'm really happy to have Andreas here. So Andreas, how are you doing? You are in Malta, correct? Yes. Okay, and you have been there for a while. That's become your home base. You left Germany. How many years ago? Um, we set up this kind of a winter base, um, which is our established uh, most other cities. This is kind of a family uh, home base, which we use mostly in winter um, in 95. So okay. this was after my phase in Asia. So when I came back from Asia, or when I, when I decided to actually, when my first sun surfaced uh, on the horizon, then I said I would love to have a place which is English speaking, has nice weather and uh, which is well connected and where you can live a simple life embracing values which which uh, feel right that's awesome and you you've been really uh, promoting or helping people in malta become more entrepreneurial correct um yeah i, th it's, uh, I think probably wherever i am i uh, enjoy the impact which i am able to share with people which leads them to believe uh, that things are possible so if we if we all share knowledge and if we all uh, act on our collaborative uh, features then i think impossible things are easy or not let's may let's not say easy but they're possible so and i've been doing it in many places but yes malta was one of them and so it uh, had an impact that's awesome and you know we're going to talk mostly about world schooling but mm -hmm. we can also also talk about you know entrepreneurialism digital nomad because they go together right for us and yeah. um so how long have you been do you consider yourself a digital nomad or world schooling because i know you have older kids and then you have younger kids so did you world school kids, your so. older kids um, I love to to have kids because it keeps me glowing and growing and so I keep <laughs> learning a lot from my children uh, so that's the beauty of uh, life in my perspective um, I always embraced models where I uh, or I put it, put it this way I left formal schooling when I was 15 I'm the youngest of eight ch children so and I was born into a family of uh, people who have been in education for a while so my my, my mother was teaching at the primary school she was running a kindergarten my dad was running a yoga school um, that's part of my base camp at home and being the youngest of eight I had the flexibility or more flexibility probably and uh, when I realized that I do not want to continue schooling, um, they didn't really argue with me. There was a very limited to no resistance to me taking a different path and uh, signing up for an apprenticeship where I could actually learn things I was interested in. And uh, ever since I left formal schooling, I was able to really learn all the things I was excited about versus somebody telling me that I should get excited at 7.50 in the morning about a subject which was often badly presented and uh, if i'm getting too active in the classroom i'm told stop you ask too many questions and so uh that did just not feel right this uh, was not something which uh, resonated with me so okay, so you've been that's, that's where i come from self-directed learning yourself as when you were a teenager that's um, when it we use all this terminology i believe it's all very human yeah so uh, we came up with digital normal with world schooling with all these kind of things i believe that is helping people to get out of their current box. Yes, I understand why those terms help. I believe if you if you look into human beings uh, and how they unfold, and uh, if you look at what Ken Robinson in one of his earlier TED speeches documented, that 98% of pre-kindergarten kids are tested at genius level when it comes to problem solving and creativity. 
and this 98% is systematically killed and brought down to a 10% level when they're finishing with their studies. So I understand with hindsight why all of this felt odd to me and why I really enjoyed learning things I'm excited about. And uh, I, first of all, I remember them. Mm -hmm. Second, I don't stop until I figure out a level which I'm excited about. So, and this is a paradigm. You can now use terminologies as you did right now, um, but this is human. Yeah, this mm -hmm. is intrinsically human. This is why e human uh, empowered human beings are actually uh, consciously questioning everything which is put in front of them, like the kids do. Yeah, go mm -hmm. to a playground and watch them playing. So we have all the answers over there. Yeah, yeah. and so um, I believe that as, as, we, as long as we allow this empowerment to continue and stop telling them no all the time, but rather telling them yes mm -hmm. and um, supporting their curiosity, that's, that's where the world will take off to a degree which we haven't even imagined so far. Yeah, that's what I'm always trying to tell people is that the traditional school system, it, that is artificial, that was constructed um, to, you know, strip away the, this beautiful natural learning that you're talking about that's innate in us, the curiosity and the creativity, and to, you know, have us be obedient factory workers or corporate workers or whatever. Um, but let's talk about what motivated you to start uh, traveling or living abroad with your family and, you know, world schooling and learning from the world. What motivated you to do that versus staying in Germany all the time? Um, I remember those days <clears throat> when I discovered the public bus system. Well, let's start earlier when I got my first bicycle. So I remember how the radius of my life increased. Yeah, so I discovered neighborhoods, which I wasn't aware of. I was all excited. And then when I was on the bus, I often said, okay, I will stay on the number six bus, which got me from my, my whatever, where I, where I lived with my parents, from my home into this town. I said, okay, on the way back, I just stay on the bus and see until it ends. Mm -hmm. Because I knew the system is designed. So from there, they stop and then they drive all the way back. So you can get out where you were supposed to get out, but you yeah. see something different. And I loved that. So it was a great way for me to see stuff, which I had no idea that it existed. And then I realized when I had my first... Uh, tiny motorbike, I was able to go to the Netherlands, which was only a few kilometers from where I grew up. And so discovering crossing a border at the time you needed a passport or an ID card, and uh, which was possible. And so to just go to the farmer's market in the Netherlands, which was 50, 60 kilometers away, so easy, um, you have a totally different flair. You see different different colors, you s different smells, different food, and a very enriched experience when you come from a kind of a black and white German angle. Um, and so I found that fascinating. And uh, I was curious to ask, why is that the case? What is the history of the Netherlands? Why is so close to us? We have a farmer's market with a much wider spectrum. And then I learned about Indonesia and Dutch colonies and all this stuff. And so um, I always found it fascinating to learn how the world ticks. And to do that, you have to get out of a local fish tank. So I learned that early and um, I love to learn. And learning includes meeting people who are interesting to learn from and crossing borders and, and uh, looking at different cultures is a super powerful way to do that. Okay, so you basically have gone further, further, first with the with the bus and then the motorbike and then maybe an airplane and yes. someday yep. a rocket ship. <laughs> no, this is the same how I got with telecommunications because telecommunication was fascinating. I said, you know what, you don't have to go back to see if somebody calls. Yeah, I got a regular answering machine when I was really young. I had my own phone line because my father was upset with the phone bill. So I used my own pocket money and a phone line. And then I had an answering machine for that phone line. And I had a remote control to get access to the messages from that phone line. So and I, I, when, when new stuff came up, I got all excited about it and explored the opportunity. And so this is why after my apprenticeship, I started a telecommunication company. Um, yeah, so I believe as long as people can talk, yeah, they can learn more. They can ask people who know more than they do. Yeah, so it's, it's a wonderful way of being faster and sharing knowledge and uh, prosper for all together. And people who talk to each other don't shoot each other. Yeah, and thanks to telecommunications, you know, mobile phones, the internet, I mean, all this yep. technology that you were, you know, one of the innovators doing, mm -hmm. we can live this lifestyle. So um, thanks to what you've done and creative, we're, we're able to live this lifestyle. Well, you and all the other people who invented yes. I was I was born by coincidence in the city where these GSM, so the digital mobile standard, was uh, tested and, and uh, developed. So what we call GSM these days. 
And so I was there. And so this was part of my, my late uh, teenage years and learning more about it and asking questions. And it was fascinating that you, could, for the first time, could take a phone with a SIM card and go across a border. And as soon as the phone connects to the network, it gets obtains the information from the home location register, like checking your passport. And then it says, yes or no. Are you allowed to spend money in this network? Or are you not? So, um, and that is fascinating because that works in 193 countries by now. Mm -hmm. And I believe that at a certain point, that concept will apply as well for visas. So we can travel like a SIM card and uh, we can check our history and we can share information about us and that will make crossing borders easy. Mm -hmm. So we take the prejudice away. If you don't have a German passport or you don't have an American passport that you looked at, mm, who are you? So, and uh, what we have right now with this is two thirds of the world having non-privileged passports that should disappear. And GSM is a good model to apply for a similar uh, system which could easily be used across borders to identify people, their background. And uh, yeah, great, welcome, because you're a great traveler and we know that you will be a good actor in our country and we don't believe that you will ruin our social system and it's fantastic, you're welcome. Okay. So it should not be branded on a, on a, by the way, you are from Venezuela, bad luck for your lifetime. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, so many people suffer because of... Yes things that their government is doing and therefore they have a crappy password and it limits their opportunity. So yeah. Um, so let's talk about how you and your family travel. You spend part of the time in Malta. Where else do you like to travel to or roam around um, with your kids? We don't plan that so much. Uh, I, I get assignments to check out new places as an example, because people consider me as having some, some expertise and some helicopter perspective and a broader picture. Um, inside so i'm i'm sometimes invited to go to a place for two months and check it out and then give them feedback we're in albania for, for a little while ago. yeah as an example and uh, we are now going to cyprus and um, i love doing that because i believe finding places for people who have or want to have young children is one of the most transformative opportunities on the planet yeah so i remember when i came back from asia and i created a base in malta how people in Germany I went to school with looked at me and said, what, where, how, why? And so I said, you yeah, it's cool because they don't need winter clothes and you don't need a heating system. And, but, but for them, it was still odd. But uh, <laughs> now it's different because people have a high sensitivity when it comes to heating bills. And people say, oh, that was a good move. It was not my consideration at the time. But uh, the powerful factor, if we follow the fiber optic cables and look at the world, that people with young children can go to places which support their family model, which support the childhood, which support the remote work opportunity. So the same family who makes whatever it is, let's say 100 euros, this 100 euros might last three times longer. Mm -hmm. They might have multiple education options, including some local schools. So mm -hmm. they can offer better education to their children. They can spend more quality time with their children. Uh, they have a portfolio from, of, of upsides which are available in 2023 and which I love to share. Yeah, and you're, so you're looking for kind of up and coming places, yeah. places that have like um, a lot of advantages for families, yes? Yes, but you know what, up and coming, if you look at Malta, that was the population roots, the official history as of today is 12,000 BC. So, but as we know, when we look at, uh, it, I think last week it was, we figured out finally how the Romans created concrete at the time, which actually lasts. So it took us 2000 years to figure that out. So, uh, but the, the known history of a place like Malta is going back to 12,000 BC. So there are often some old places or places with history. Yes. If we have fiber optics, then the thing can change. Yeah. yeah. And so um, the situation switches. So mm -hmm. that is a powerful feature. And then with, with travel and visa regulations, I learned last year when I was in Istanbul um, that they make it so much easier now for Indonesians to come to Turkey. Yeah, and you know, the, the size of the middle class of Indonesia is staggering, the size of the, the Turkish population. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so these are opportunities which change the world for the better because it creates an open border mindset and by far more collaborative attitude. It breeds a different use. This is with you, your teenage daughters. Um, they consider probably most of the world as their home and they have no problem to go to any new location and embrace what it's good for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's powerful. Yeah. And your kids, too. 
Yeah, and yeah. What benefits do you see in your kids um, by living this lifestyle, this traveling, world schooling, nomadic lifestyle? Uh, the simplest is Ken Robinson's summary of 98% genius level when it comes to problem solving and creativity. Mm -hmm. So if our kids have uh, st stick to their genius level of creativity, if our kids stick to their genius level of problem solving, the only thing they have to learn is how to learn. Mm -hmm. And if we can keep that alive, yeah, that's all needed. So I believe we can do it as simple. Look at that Ken Robinson speech. It won a TED award at the time. It's, yeah. uh, I think, the most viewed TED speech it's, it's ever. It's one of the most viewed, yeah. yeah. And, and I will so I, the comments later. That's all, this, all, this, all we need. And, and I remember the guy who started TED, the TED founder I met in 1997, and how he, and he introduced me, he opened my eyes to many, many, way, many, many new ways of addressing education. And he introduced me to people like Ken Robinson and a few others. And yes, that's a powerful insight to have. And this is where people who in the last 40 years already looked at this and uh, triggered positive change. So in a nutshell summary, the only reason or if, if, uh, if any children I have as my biolog biolog biological children or any, any people I'm involved with, if we can keep the 98% alive, that's super powerful. And this will create e-humans or empowered humans who will have no problem solving any problems which are coming up. I agree. I agree. But what challenges um, do you and your family face living this lifestyle? Because I, I, I ask because I have, you know, Facebook friends and people in my Facebook group who are from various countries in Europe or Asia where homeschooling is illegal and, you know, it's very difficult to deregister. They ask about what do we do about banking and having a business license, like when you're not in all the this, country, all like, these problems are already solved. And so you can obtain well, that. How did you solve it? No, but by, by being curious and asking questions. So the, the same thing I did when I was 15, when I left formal schooling, um, all the answers, all the things which you right now mentioned are already solved. Um, I experienced a day and age when it was illegal to even take uh, to take a phone across the border if it wasn't if, if it wasn't connected to the network in that country. Then we created a system where it's now possible to cross into 193 countries, and within a few seconds, you're authorized to actually use a network. So we changed that whole paradigm. Mm -hmm. uh, people consider uh, in certain places of, let's say, the kinder the kinder chocolate egg, which you can buy in Europe. In America, it's illegal. Yeah. Good. So yeah. So hazard, uh, I think. Yeah, yeah, this 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 absurd examples like a kinder chocolate egg, uh, while in America you can buy a weapon with an ID card and a credit card. So uh, we have different concepts, mm -hmm. and uh, the today's illegal has nothing to do with the fact does it does it is it actually the one or I would always ask myself the question does it feel right and uh, does it make does it have a common sense factor which is above five out of ten. So and. Then the question of legality often unfolds over time and uh, in a relatively short time frame because there are more and more people who are picking these things up. And yes, uh, in the day and age where you can take your phone into 193 countries, where you can take a credit card into another probably same 193 countries, uh, you can find solutions for all the other issues. Okay. My so strong recommendation yes. is to always do them in a legal manner. Yeah, that's the number one issue. And you find legal solutions. Okay, so uh, let's, let's give some practical advice about this. Um, about what? About like uh, a bank. So instead of banking in Germany or Denmark or wherever, you use transfer wise, right? The online banking. Wise, wise works, Revolut works. You have these kind of online focused uh, mm -hmm. tech banks and you have these conventional banks too. And the common conventional banks are now using mobile apps and they're actually well organized so you can reach them remotely. The US has a few of those and uh, Germany has a few of those as well. The UK always had a few of those. It's really a question of where you come from. So if you have a history in a certain country, I would always keep for sure one banking uh, mm -hmm alignment with that history because for them it's much easier to process you as a human being because you fit into their normal criteria mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, when you then in your in your new setup then you can add certain features and they include as an example why they include things like revolute they can include other options in different countries but okay. i would always stick to a few which which are based on where you come from uh, because this is a backup situation and this is something which is easier to do with on in many circumstances Okay, and do you recommend um, that nomads who have a business or who are freelancers um, form a company in Malta or the Republic of Georgia or Singapore? I mean, there's a lot of 
popular places in the Caribbean to, to form um, a company. That, that, that is, you can form as many things as you want. The question is, what are you actually doing? So what is your fiscal and legal setup? So the taxation, the fiscal side, and the legal situation is relevant. And then just setting up a com company, you can set up companies wherever you want. Is this something which solves your fiscal issues? It's a totally different question. So you have to be careful to make sure you answer those things and do it properly. So if you set up a company in Estonia, but you are never in Estonia and you run all the stuff through Estonia, it doesn't, doesn't protect or it doesn't solve your personal taxation model because that is in many jurisdictions considered as a letterbox company or kind of a, a kind of sham. So um, you really have to think that through and depending on what you want to do, there are some people like Staatenlos, uh, Christoph Heuermann, there are some people like Normal Capitalists, uh, there are a few guys who are actually providing insights. And then the question is, what are you doing? Are you selling a service, which is an online service? Are you selling a product which gets shipped around? And so those issues are important to look into. And the second thing is, how do people pay you? Yeah, if you set up a company in any funny jurisdiction, you will not even get a bank account. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you will not be able to process clients' money. Yeah, so many for many things, it's important to potentially consider an American LLC or other things because they're easier and uh, they actually come with payment options where people can send you money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. setting up anything somewhere mm -hmm. in a funny country doesn't really help you. I think some people are just concerned because their government seems to have like their claws in them, you know, and it's hard to like extricate themselves and take their kids out of school, deregister and all of that. So they're just trying to figure out how other successful European entrepreneurs have done this. I hear you. I uh, don't agree because I believe that most people have just never looked into it. So in none of their schooling models, in none of their studies, some practical issues when it comes to legal and fiscal frameworks have never been part of the education. So there's, there's rarely anybody who teaches them a course of how to get the right visa for which country. There's rarely somebody who even teaches them which kind of equipment to take to which kind of country to make sure it fits into the relevant sockets. Yeah. So, so there's basic things. Yeah. Sorry, they're not. They just have a funny alert system. If, you travel, if I would have taken all the medication. I was supposed to take based on the German travel alert situation, I would probably, my head would be glowing by now. Yeah, but I've been in many occasions traveling or spending two months in India and I took a fraction of what they recommended for India. But recommending anything for India, which is just huge, does not necessarily apply if you're spending two months in Bombay. Yeah, so, uh, but their travel recommendations were India. So they didn't have a travel recommendation for Bombay but there are tons yeah. of Germans who take everything they're told to take right, because right. it was under India. Yeah? Yeah. So, um, common sense and intuition are, are very powerful feature. We don't teach that at school yet, mm -hmm. um, but uh, having questioning things which you are told is good to make sure it feels right for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how has this lifestyle impacted your relationship with your family, with your kids, with your partner? Um, you spend more time with them, obviously, yeah. than yeah. if you were living a traditional life, right? Um, I, you know what, I, in, my, in my early 20s, I was all over the place and traveling and working because I loved what I did and uh, I didn't feel like work, but I was doing it kind of seven days per week and had a great time doing it. Um, at this stage and with children, I love spending time with the children. And so I love to travel with one or two of them at times by myself and take them along. I often take them into meetings or sessions and they listen and they ask good questions. And I believe those things are highly relevant. So uh, from a quality of life perspective, I'm sure that that package is a reason for my exceptional health uh, and mental well-being. So... Mm -hmm. I had many difficulties in my life, which I've been dealing with. And so, but nevertheless, I was able to grow through them and uh, stay healthy. And uh, I know many folks my age who have 10 plus health problems and whatever. And wow. uh, spending time with the children and in such a simple thing like spending two hours on the beach is a healthy feature. And mm -hmm. I normally try to arrange that if they are going out in the morning and join them somewhere around noon for two hours and uh, then continue working later. So... And mm -hmm. that is, uh, yes, as you said before, that's a luxury and it's great. I love it. Yeah. So what would you, what kind of advice would you give to people just starting out in this lifestyle? Newbies. Um, advice is uh, something which, uh, the best advice I've seen probably is to, to meditate and to listen to your inner voice. That's the first thing. And um, that's probably the first 10 pieces of advice I would give in a, on a repetitive basis. 
And then if that resonates, whatever the outcome is, if what your invoice tells you, then, then uh, explore it, find out. And don't be surprised if anybody and everybody, probably 90 plus percent of the people around you uh, do not support you, then you're probably right mm -hmm. in doing what you feel is right. So uh, I just experienced it, including my mother. Um, there was a certain point where I wouldn't tell her where I'm traveling to. Uh, she just had my German phone number and left a voicemail and I called her back. And mm -hmm. she said, Andreas, where are you? I said, Mama, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I have to know. I said, no, you don't have to know. I'm calling back. How are you? So, um, but the, the, the kind of a desire of a parent of genera that generation to physically locate you, to form an opinion about it, and mm -hmm. to read in the papers all the drama stories about it, mm -hmm. it's just, just kind of a uh, terror experience. So I just ignored it. And so the fact of having a voicemail and calling her back worked well. And um, take that freedom. Yeah, mm -hmm. so ignore, ignore many things people tell you. I was told that mobile phones have no future. I was, I was told 20 years ago, mobile internet on mobile phones will never work because people love it on a desktop. So I've been, I've been hearing so many things where I was told it's impossible. And when I told them, by the way, people will in the future only have a, a mobile device. And to, but you know what? Is this all, if, if you just listen to your inner voice, then things will feel right. And then everything which is kind of artificially fabricated around it um, falls off. So as an example, you spoke about traditional schooling. Um, homeschooling is actually traditional schooling. Yeah, so the idea of putting people into a box is only 200 years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we call this traditional schooling or we call it alternative medicine. Uh, what we call traditional medicine right now is only kind of 140 years old. Mm -hmm. So we have been living for thousands of years with this stuff, including Roman concrete. Um, and you know what? Uh, we still have a lot to learn from the past. Yeah, I have a couple more questions, but I want to see if anyone watching us have any questions. Um, we do have some comments. Priyanka, who you introduced me to, she's in India. She says hello. And um, we've got Katie. I think she's in uh, Las Vegas. I know her. Charlotte uh, Daly from the UK. She says, my kids and I, uh, my kids are now having to learn how to free learn. They have been so indoctrinated by the terrible school system for so long. Best thing I've ever done is to take them out. And yeah, she's very excited to become proper global citizens. So please, uh, you guys ask Andrea's questions while we have them online. And then I guess uh, my question is, if you're working on any projects that you want to let us know about right now. You, you, mentioned, you mentioned Priyanka right now. And when, when I brought this up with you, you mentioned your experience at Galileo, where you spoke with some people in India who are very much on the let's be Let's, in, let's embrace the Western model more than the Westerners did. Mm -hmm. Yes, you are right. But if you look exact, look, if you look, look into Indian history, you see that homeschooling was a very popular and standard feature. And if you look into Bangalore in the early 1990s, how Cisco and others outsourced the entire IT development and, and innovation departments to that part of the world. Why is it that in 2023, the majority of the C-level people in the knowledge-based companies are all of Indian descent and background? Yeah, so or if you look at some of the forward-thinking people like Sugata Mitra, um, who came up with education models which exclude teachers. <laughs> yeah, you just Is that put the kids. guy who put the computer out um, mm -hmm. in a small yes. town. Yeah, yes, he, he did. He did a few things, and uh, but you see there, India is such a rich country when it comes to interesting people who are, are enormously resourceful, uh, and and it's, they they are just. It's just such an umbrella, and so uh, we'll see. I'm, I'm just, I'm just happy that Priyanka is now taking a move and getting, uh, sharing her knowledge with the rest of the world, and then sharing things like what you are doing with people in India. Because whenever India wakes up, and whenever Indonesia wakes up, uh, their middle class is uh, bigger than the population of Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, and they have no problem with having kids. <laughs> yeah, here it's very unpopular. Yeah, so in Japan it's very unpopular. But in India, they still love having kids. Yeah, yeah. We need them. Um, yeah. Jennifer is saying hi from Virginia. And Katie is saying her son left school at seven years old. Today, he's 19 and teaching in online schools based on how he learned. And kids love it. He's yeah. hoping to become a digital nomad. Um, okay, people, Christine, people, like, people like him, people like him, we should invite to Bansko. So if he needs a ticket to Bansko, if, if, if people like him being on stage and sharing that knowledge is powerful. Yeah, so we had that at TAT uh, a few years ago, but this is this is exactly the case. So people like your your daughters and him, this is uh, how you create this multiplication effect in the remote working hubs and young families or families with young children 
uh, them seeing that will trigger the positive pandemic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I love it. Uh, Christina is wondering if you can share any of your favorite books. Um, there's no one favorite book, really. I, what, and you know what? Whenever I found a good book, I normally call the author. Oh. Yeah, so I found always it's more interesting than to meet the people. And um, this is, and it, and it worked in a few cases, in a few cases. And so it, it's, it's something which I enjoyed. Yeah, and so uh, this is where I learned the most and spending an evening or two with those guys and staying in contact because it's really exceptional. And often it's significantly more interesting to meet the people than to read the book. Like uh, there are case studies written about our first business, which uh, at that time was very innovative in this uh, GSM or digital mobile communication world. And so I was invited to, to uh, teach at some business schools and logically the, the documentation of the company, which I was co-creating at the time, sounded very different from our actual experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, this is the downside with books that often the uh, author itself gets boiled down through publishing houses and other features. And they're by far more interesting than the book. Well, okay. What well, which authors are you interested in, or have been the um, last? I, I met I met Richard Worman through that. So I had a book which he wrote, the guy who started founded TED, and this is how I reached out to him and met him. And so um, I met him in the US, and he came with his wife to to Malta at a certain point. And so this has been one example, and um, a few others who are now on the digital nomad subject as an example, who looked into the history of nomadism of the last uh, twenty thousand years, how it was actually the model of humanity, which was by far the dominant one in the past, and how knowledge was shared. Yeah, and then we actually came up with setting up in territories. And then we built the big walls, kind of fighting each other, whoever wanted to get in. So and this is how the war zone started. And if you look into the last uh, thousand years of European uh, borders on YouTube, there's some nice videos and see how the borders changed yeah, all the time. Uh, yeah. and so they're missing a column which says dead bodies next to it. So, <laughs> yeah, because then you would realize how much more human uh, a nomadic mindset is versus fighting people at your wall mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> so, right. uh, nobody can remember all the european borders or nobody cares what the countries were called mm -hmm. yeah but uh, you had such a egomanic perspective of trying to protect something which is not protectable um and which shouldn't be protected it would rather be shared knowledge included uh, instead of killing each other Mm -hmm. No, I and what, totally what we're doing, what we're doing with, with global citizens or world mindset is exactly that. You it's, yeah. it will be impossible uh, to to afterwards create some kind of fantasy stories of why we now should go out and kill each other. Yeah, people I mean, it's hard to it. kill people when you're there, you they're your brothers and sisters and cousins when you get to know them actually. Yes. Um, so what is your prediction for this lifestyle? The remote work, digital nomad, world schooling, kind of location independent lifestyle. I mean, it's growing. It's, no, it's, 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 all, it's also, ultimately, we are loving, or put it this way, the, the World Economic Forum published something yesterday where they said the biggest uh, of the five upcoming crises for this year is the cost of living. Mm -hmm. And so they say what I call the Putin factor um, is a, it's a wake up call for people getting a shock about their life expenses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when I was in Germany in November briefly for a workshop, um, I saw people who are in their big house and they, instead of getting a heating, heating bill, which was, let's say, 500 euros, now they got one, which is two and a half thousand euros. And they cannot afford to heat the whole house. They have now a heated kitchen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and the whole house logically was never designed for that. Yeah. Um, there are the wake up scenario where those people say, you know what, why don't we just leave for the winter? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. For that money, we can go somewhere else and have a great time. So um, I, I believe that this is the biggest wake up call ever. Uh, and don't forget, the, the biggest situation is the dropping population numbers on the global scale. We have more adult diapers in Italy than baby diapers. We have more adult diapers in Japan than baby diapers. And so uh, you have a situation where our entire infrastructure systems at a certain point will collapse. People mm -hmm. at this stage do not want to have children because, again, the systems suck. Mm -hmm. If you go to a place like Bansko, it's fun to have kids because you see people like Magnus, age two, running through Bansko. Mm -hmm. And everybody kind of is okay with it. So if yeah. you are able as a young family to embrace places where your 100 euros last three times longer, where people are open-minded, where education options exist, which are empowering families and which are empowering children, that is a big shift. Mm -hmm. There's nothing which, which will stop them. So people who are conscious parents, who are consciously enjoying having children, they will be so attracted to go to those places 
It's unstoppable. I had a debate. I've had a debate with a couple of people about how the nomads or tourists or, you know, mm-hmm. we Westerners going to a, a developing country en masse and gentrifying uh, their area and causing inflation, like what's happening in Mexico City right now. There's tons of people from New York and San Francisco going there and they're, oh my gosh, it's so cheap and they're overpaying and it's driving the locals out. And this has happened in Barcelona, it's happened in many cities around the world where just either whether it's tourism or remote workers or nomad, digital nomads, um, what what do you feel about that? Because I it's, tried- It's, it's, it's irrelevant. Way. It's irrelevant because you're talking about the party generation of people who want to go there and people with, with kids and, and uh, remote working families would not go to Mexico City. They will go to a small place is they, they're, they're digital nomads are going there maybe not digital nomads, digital nomads yes but you know what they will go to the next place when the party moves so um that's but the people who have been living in those neighborhoods for generations they're having to move out because but, yeah, but this but this was the same in south beach in miami so this was the same in winwood in miami this was the same in so many places where you had people moving in who were able to obtain yeah. and purchase an apartment which was uh, triple the price of what's the entire unit was on which on, 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 on which pieces of land or which plot actually then the five-story building was created. So oh, that is a gentrification is model. This is you had it everywhere and anywhere in the world. So this is a normal model. What I'm trying to say is this is independent from the major change. The major change are people who are consciously deciding to have children and who want to be part of creating a tomorrow for a generation of empowered humans. Mm -hmm. So this is not the party people who will go to the next place and the next place and the next place, depending on who offers a package and the party and who, where they want to go, wherever they want to get lost next. Yeah, Mm -hmm. so, and this was Ibiza 20, 30 years ago. Yeah, and it keeps moving. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. One guy wanted to build a wall to keep the Mexican out, I think, and he didn't anticipate that there are more Americans going the other direction. Yes. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, okay, so uh, I know you post a lot on social media. Um, where can Where is the best pe- place for people to follow you? Um, I, I know you post on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. I, I, use, right? I use LinkedIn normally. This is something which okay. works really well. And so Instagram works for other things. But uh, we'll see how all of that unfolds because nobody knows who, uh, how they operate and which platform will be merged with which one in the future. It's a simple way to share a, sim- a brief insight on a relatively daily basis and to reshare stuff which comes to me, which I believe is worthwhile to be shared. So this is all I actually do. I process a lot because it arrives... Um, on my screen or it arrives in my awareness level and when it's something which i believe which can could boost other people i'm happy to reshare it that's the thing which i do most of the times yes you're Um, really wonderful about people people can always reach me directly which has worked well for the last 50 plus years um and um i believe as i said the biggest focus here are normative families people with an open border mindset who want to create a generation of empowered children uh, to a degree which hasn't existed for the last 200 years. So mm-hmm. take them out of the box and actually keep them on the Ken Robinson level, which is a 98% genius for problem solving and creativity. That's all it takes, nothing more. And then we can call it homeschooling, world schooling, parallel schooling. You know, all those terms are irrelevant. All of them will contribute to it. As an example, mm-hmm. my oldest daughter, Maya, uh, she was signed up for the Waldorf school in Zagreb. And so uh, she was supposed to go there for four months to just have that experience as mm-hmm. an additional experience in her portfolio because she fell in love with the teacher there. So then COVID hit. So the physical school was closed, but she still had the tutor. So the, the teacher from that school still helped her for a few months. Then she had an acting teacher. And so you find great tutors. Yeah, we yeah. found somebody last year from Germany who was a primary school teacher. She came for nearly 10 months. And it's great. You so find, you have these tutors in person or online? Yes, you... Both, both. Okay. Both. So I, I, I believe in both and uh, the depending on where we are, it's something where often that is a compelling scenario for some of them to spend some time as well. Mm-hmm. How yeah. many kids do you have traveling with you now? Uh, four. Four. Okay. So the oldest is, is Maya, right? Maya, Maya. But Maya is uh, my oldest daughter. I co-parent her with her mother, but she spends okay. half her time with her mother and she spends... Yeah, around half the time with me. So, and so yeah. she loves it. She loves her siblings and she loves the life with her mother. And so, this is one of the things which is beautiful to see that instead yeah. of dragging kids through a civil war in family courts, which is a hobby of the 
law society on the planet. And uh, I think it's actually possible to create wonderful human uh, beings who are actually enjoying the fact that they have complementary parents, even though if they decide to not stay in a romantic relationship. I just watched uh, something on YouTube, uh, this Australian documentary. In Japan, it's common for uh, parents split up to have one of them has sole custody and the other doesn't see them at all. That's their law. And people are trying to change this law, but it's just insane. So, um, okay, so wonderful. The, the, the suicide rate of, people, of, of yeah. parents who kill themselves over, over those examples is, is more than a thousand per week. And uh, oh the, the trauma it creates for the children will, will yeah. be, is one of the reasons why we have a teenage uh, depression or mental health pandemic. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's not surprising that those teenagers actually have burnouts before they turn 20. Yeah, yeah, there's multiple reasons for that. Mm -hmm. I think school is one of them. Yeah, um, but this, but destroyed parent dynamics is a, is a it's, it's even closer to their heart. Yeah, okay. All right. Well, I wish we could talk longer. I know you're busy. Uh, we have a few uh, comments, but they're just, mm -hmm. you know, saying basically they agree with what you're saying. Um, so, yeah, I will post uh, the Ken Robinson TED Talk in the comments later, and then I'll post your LinkedIn in case people want to start following you there. And Perfect. any last, uh, you know, things that you want to say to... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm proud about what you were doing. I remember our dialogues early last year in Bansko, and it's fantastic to see that you are focusing on that segment of, I think, bringing people into the awareness and giving them our guidance how to do the first steps so kind of a walking support mechanism and that's fantastic so uh, they all have to learn how to walk and none of them went to parenting school yeah and all of them know that the schooling model they had themselves actually sucks but the most of them are still scared shitless to do something about it and mm -hmm. so it's for them it's important to have somebody like you around who has lived it and who is living it and who, and who is loving the factor of sharing that knowledge so it's great to see Thank you, Andreas. And everyone, Andreas is the one who convinced me not to focus on the digital nomad um, career coaching and focus more on the travel with families um, and the world schooling, the education bit. So the next um, generation. Because, yeah, because I think a lot of people are afraid and they don't really know how they're overwhelmed and uh, there's everyone's so used to regular school. And so I want to I and Andreas and others want to help show them that there is a much better way. So you, thank you, you everyone. Keep them on ninety-eight percent. Yeah, exactly. Let's keep our kids being geniuses. So thank yeah. you, Andreas. And sure. um, yeah, I'll stop the Facebook Live, and we'll catch up um, soon. Maybe I'll see you in Bansko this summer. <laughs> okay. Bye.